So you're saying the people who use violence are now out of control? Well, I don't believe they're out of control. Nobody forces you to break the law, do they? The government forces us to do so, I believe. If Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement imagined it had the unqualified support of the international community, it had better think again. The British government has slammed what it called a hard core of demonstrators, warning that their violence was unacceptable and had to stop. My guest this week here in Berlin is Joey Hsu, a pro-democracy activist and spokesperson for a number of student unions in Hong Kong. Shouldn't her movement now accept that it's time to make a deal with the Hong Kong government before that too becomes impossible? Joyce Yu, welcome to Conflict Zone. My pleasure. If it's wrong for the Hong Kong police to use violence, mm. why is it right for the demonstrators to use it? Well, first of all, I don't think the level of violence used by the protesters are based on the intention to attack anybody. I believe the intention of using violence is only to protect ourselves, because seeing that the police had been beating up protesters without a reason when the police So you're been... saying they retaliate? Yes. But they do more than retaliate, don't they? October 20th, we had a group of hardcore yes. protesters throwing petrol bombs mm. at a station, police station. That wasn't retaliation. A week earlier, one protester stabbed a policeman with a box mm. cutter. We had a homemade bomb mm. which went off on the roadside, mm. which by the grace of God didn't hurt anybody or kill anybody. It's that kind of violence I'm talking about. Well, What's the justification? Well, I believe the justification is because when protesters realize that peaceful demonstrations and marches are no longer useful in calling the government to respond to their demands, I believe that's why, that is the reason why they're trying to use violence to express their anger, express their fury against the police force. And but this is random violence, what we're talking about, random violence. Yes, and I agree that in all means we should try to use peaceful means to call for the response for the government. And I believe the usage of violence would not be the resolution of forcing the government to respond to our demands. So you're saying the people who use violence are now out of control? Well, I don't believe they're out of control. Because, well, well, one of your fellow protesters talked mm. to the London Financial Times last month. He's called Mark. He's 17 mm. years old. He said, I feel like we can't restrain ourselves anymore. The hatred towards the police is growing stronger and stronger can't restrain ourselves. That sounds very much like someone and a movement which is getting out of control. I believe that it's only some individual cases. I believe on a, on a common ground that most of the protesters are still doing, doing things on, based on a reason. For example, like they vandalize NTR stations, they vandalize those sh restaurants or other shops that are related to Chinese funded companies because... Well, we'll come on like to that to, a bit later. Mm. I want to talk to you about the measures you use. But some of your leading figures are worried by the violence, aren't they? Johnson Young, who mm. was an organizer of the 2014 Umbrella Movement, he said, every stakeholder should take action immediately if we don't want the violence to escalate to a point where there's yes, no I turning agree. back. But why don't you stand up and say, enough with the violence? Well, I believe one of the principles among the protesters is about no splitting and no condemning any of our protesters, even though the, the level of violence they use are, seems to be like escalating and might be posing some harms to the others. So you maintain almost Chinese Communist Party unity. That's vital for you, is it? I think nobody can argue, nobody can talk, nobody can dispute. Well, we do argue and we do discuss about our actions and even, even after those vandalizations, we've got some discussions online on the f online forums about and we do the reflections of, on, on our actions. So I believe there are... But the violence still goes on. Who, who can stop it? Who can order it to stop? Well, I believe nobody, nobody. can try to stop it unless... Nobody. So it's out of control then if nobody can stop it. Unless... When the, unless when the younger generations send together, they're willing to stand up with, together with the older generations, for example, like, say for like student leaders together with some significant leaders from the pro-democracy side, when, when these leaders try to stand up together and say, now we have to do something peaceful and to stop the violence, I believe that might be a, 
there might be a way to stop the violence. And another thing that I'm sounds saying, pretty tentative. That sounds pretty tentative, mm. pretty difficult. Once the train is rolling, nobody, it seems, in your group can stop it. That's, that's dangerous, isn't it? Yes, I agree. So that's why we had been organizing peaceful marches and rallies to, to, try to, switch the, to try to switch the tactics that we are using on protesting to call for the government to respond to our demands. And I believe everybody in the society had been working very hard. For example, like we are organizing general strikes. We had been organizing class boycotting campaigns because we would like to try to explore other peaceful means so that we do I not have to use violence. If in, if in the meantime mm. you should, God forbid, kill anybody, an innocent passerby or, or a policeman, your movement's finished then, isn't it? Your international support will evaporate overnight. Yes, I agree. Are you prepared to take that risk? And you won't come out in public and say, we need to stop this. The British government has slammed, last week, has slammed what it called a hardcore minority, said the violence was unacceptable. Mm -hmm. This is the sound of your international support wavering and, and leaving you, isn't it? Yes, well, I believe the escalation of violence and those violence scenes is might would definitely be very concerning to the international society when all the free world countries are advocating using peaceful means to bring the situation to a, to a result. But they're telling you you've gone too far already. Doesn't that matter? Well, of course that matters, but I think the most important thing is about how can we hold our government accountable and how can we bring them to respond to our demands? What about the judiciary? You've had criticism from judicial institutions in Hong Kong, pretty heavy criticism. Um, these are the bodies that mm. enjoy considerable respect around the world for their impartiality. Again, if you're losing them, this is a really bad sign for you. The Law Society, for instance, said all forms of unlawful violence, particularly against the police, the use of petrol bombs against the police, as well as the apparent attacks on the families of police officers and bullying of their children at school. Mm. Do you approve of those methods, bullying the children of police officers at school? Well, I don't agree with those methods. But still, we stick to a principle of no splitting. Um, so you don't agree with the violence and you don't agree with the bullying of the children. Um, doesn't sound as though there's much you agree with, but you'll stay silent anyway. No, we had been advocating using peaceful means, for example, like peaceful rallies, marches to, to express our concerns and demands. And, but the point is that we do not publicly condemn those actions, but still we try to use our peaceful means, to use our own peaceful means to try to switch the tactics. And yet others are using intimidation, mafia style in intimidation. We have a report of one teenage daughter of an officer being harassed by an adult while she was playing sport. They said to her, what your father is doing is disgusting, since when are children responsible for the actions of their parents? Well, first of all, I don't think any family members of those police officers should be responsible for their own disgusting actions. And but I think but the you're making them responsible. Some of your people are making them responsible, bullying them, harassing them. Well, I believe that is happening, but other or... Well, the Law Society says it's happening. They accuse you of it. Yes, I, I can't deny that it is actually happening, but still we're trying to use peaceful tactics to, to bring the situation to a resolution and I believe like bullying family members would not be a very good way to solve the situation. The Hong Kong Bar Association said your attack on the Hong Kong airport constituted serious obstruction and was in open defiance of injunctions granted by the courts. In other words, you, you broke the law. Mm. Do you want to live in a state governed by the rule of law or only the laws that you like? Of course, I would like to live in a state of rule of law. However, we can see that it is very obvious that the situation of rule of law in Hong Kong is being broken, not by the protesters, but by the government itself first. And I believe that's why protesters are marching on the street, are taking onto the streets, even though they know that it will break the law. And but, I believe but your it activists is the government. are saying, you know, that their most important aim is to fight to protect the rule of law in Hong Kong and judicial independence. But mm. you're trashing it at the same time. Well, I believe... You're breaking the law to protect the law? Doesn't add up, does it? 
Well, it is the government that forces us to take on the streets and to break the laws. It is not the protesters' Nobody intention to Nobody break the laws. Nobody forces you to break the law, do they? The government forces us to do so, I believe. That's your interpretation. But, but here, here are these judicial institutions war warning you that criminal contempt, as they put it, impedes the administration of justice and, if unchecked, will inflict grave and irreparable damage to the rule of law in Hong Kong. Grave and irreparable damage. That's what they think you're doing to Hong Kong. Doesn't that matter? Well, of course that matters. But uh, as I have mentioned, what matters the most is about whether we can actually bring a change to our political structure and our government structure. And that would be the common goal and would be the most important goal for us to achieve for this, at, this, at, at this moment. And I believe even for the Department of Justice itself isn't being totally independent for, for now. After, after the hangover of Hong Kong from the British government to the Chinese government, we can see that our core values are judicial systems being encroached by the Chinese government. We can see from the recent prosecutions that the Department of Justice is only prosecuting and putting those protesters on court while they are... But you still have independent judges. You still have independent courts. Well, in terms of system, they are independent. However, we can see that they're actually being very heavily influenced by the Chinese government, that they're sidestepping the cases of, for example, like the 21st Yunlong, 21st July Yunlong cases. They're not prosecuting, they're not taking any of the trials to, to the court, while they had been political prosecuting so many of the protesters. Okay, well, those are prosecution decisions. Joey Sue, if you ever sat down with the government and held a dialogue, who would, who would hold the talks for your side? Who could, who could authorize compromises that are essential in any kind of political dialogue? Who, who in your movement could actually sit down and authorize compromises? I believe nobody could represent our movement because, as you know, it is a leaderless... So nobody will sit down with you? You're, you're not opening doors, you're closing doors, one we after are the opening other, doors. aren't you? You just said nobody could authorize compromises, nobody can sit down for you, represent you. Well, back in Who's June, the government supposed to talk to? Well, back in June, the Chief Executive Carrie Lam has tried to approach to several student unions in Hong Kong, and we had rejected her offer because she re requested a private meeting with only some of the student unions in Hong Kong, which, which is not even representing all the students in Hong Kong. It would be a start, wouldn't it? It would have been a start. It won't be a start. It would only be an end to our movement. Because back in 2014, we see that Carrie Lam tried to talk to some of the student leaders, some of the leaders of the Umbrella Revolution. However, what we got after the, after the dialogue was that was the crackdown of our movement. And then Carrie Lam did not fulfill any of her, any of her promises in the dialogue. And we felt like, especially in this leaderless movement, it is very important for us to have a public dialogue with as many stakeholders in the society as possible. At least we cannot only have the student activists talking to Carrie Lam. Okay, we have you, to include other stakeholders. You've put forward five principal demands of the Hong Kong mm. government. You and your fellow activists have argued that the government has only addressed one of them, which was the extradition bill, mm. which they withdrew. Um, but in fact, according to Albert Chen, professor of law at the University of Hong Kong, the government responded to all of your demands, just not in the way that you wanted. You wanted an independent investigation into police handling of the riots. You didn't get that. But you didn't get nothing either. The Independent Police Complaints Council appointed five overseas experts from Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. You didn't get everything, but they did respond, didn't they? Well, I believe what are we calling for is not only an official demand for official response from Carrie Lam. What we are asking for is about the concrete actions by the Hong Kong government. We are asking them to respond to our demands by taking actual actions. For example, no, they talking did. about I mean they invited these experts. From from Britain, Canada, Australia and New well, Zealand. Well I believe that is not what we are asking the, for. No, it's not exactly what you wanted, but it's something. We are asking for an independent commission of inquiry to investigate into police brutality. However, for the independent police commission, it is formed by mostly pro-establishment camp supporters. How can we trust them? How is it? How nobody can hold it accountable? You can't trust the overseas experts from Britain, Canada. They are only Australia, advisory New committees. They are not the one who make decisions. 
to you handle want, the complaints. You also want all charges dropped against protesters who've been arrested. And they've turned that down. But how could they do anything else? If you're, if you're found to have broken the law, you should be punished the same way as the police are, shouldn't you? So why are they... Why are you above the law? So why aren't they punishing the police? They have in the past. Police have been hauled into court and punished. We cannot even identify the police because they are not showing their warrants, because they are not showing their numbers. When we cannot hold the police accountable, when nobody can actually punish the police, how come the Hong Kong government is, it could be charging our protesters with rioting, even though they're only participating in some peaceful marches? That is, that is not reasonable. So but that's you don't why consider yourselves equal before the law with everybody else, do you? We are equal before the law. So why do you, should you get an amnesty? Why? If you've broken the law, and the Hong Kong Bar Association, the Hong Kong Law Society seem to indicate that you have broken the law, shouldn't you be punished for breaking that law? Well, I believe asking for an amnesty would be the best solution, would be the best resolution to resolve the current situation. I thought you wanted to uphold the rule of law in Hong Kong. Yes, we Joyce want. You. Yes, we want. But at the same time, then you want an amnesty. You want to escape punishment for breaking the law. I what kind say of lawless that is, society then do you want to live in? I would not say that it's trying to escape from being punished when we have broken the law. I believe the reason why protesters are taking on to the streets is because we want the government to be accountable to us. We want the government to give concrete actions in response <coughs> to our demands. And I believe that's why we are participating in peaceful marches, lawful marches, ever since June. However, the government, the police, had been accusing us, has been arresting us for rioting. And when the reason why they're arresting us is not reasonable at all, how can they charge us? So that's why we're asking... Well, we'll come on to some of, some of your other actions in a minute. But, but when it comes to the future, the worry seems to be that you don't have much of a plan, do you, except to keep fighting. You said recently, I have no idea how these protests will end or even what will happen tomorrow. We feel like there is no way back, so we must keep fighting. As if you're a passenger in this movement, but you're not a passenger in this movement. You're one of the spokespeople for this movement, aren't you? Isn't it time you took responsibility for that? Well, I think definitely I should be taking some of the responsibilities of finding the way out for Hong Kong for the whole movement. But the fact is, when the situation in Hong Kong is like changing in a, very, in a very lightning speed every day, we do not see our future. We do not even know what, what, what will be happening the next day. Because back in June, back in July, we do not expect the government to be exercising its emergency power. But you don't have a plan of where to go, do you? We, Apart from saying, we want all our demands met in full, that's the only plan you have. Haven't you? That's it. We do have a plan. We do have a plan. We are very clear that we have to rethink about our. We have to rethink about the future of Hong Kong. We have to think about the 2047 deadline, and I believe that is a consensus among Hong Kongers. Other than the five demands, we are trying to discuss. We are trying to have discussions among different stakeholders in Hong Kong about our future after 2047. But at stake is not just your fate and your fellow protesters, but millions of other people who live in Hong Kong. We are going to have to live with the fallout from your movement and from your movement's actions for many years. I mean, you may be happy to bring China's wrath down on your head, but to collapse the roof on everybody else's head in Hong Kong, is that really a responsibility you want or you're prepared to take? Well, first of all, I think the majority of Hong Kongers are still in support of the movement. And I believe most of us are quite clear that, and are getting prepared that once we are failing the movement or once, like, the Chinese Communist government would be using violent tactics to end the protests, we are very clear that what the aftermath would be. And I believe the majority of Hong Kongers would like to take the risk in order to, in order in the change of a better future of Hong Kong. But don't you have a responsibility to try and find a way back which preserves and strengthens what you already have instead of risking a crackdown in which you could lose everything? I believe we do all 
I mean, for the activists and pro-democracy politicians, we do have the responsibility. But after all, I think the greatest responsibility is the Hong Kong government itself. It is the a British political... Government, the British government calls for a meaningful dialogue between all parties with a credible political track to protect the rights and freedoms set out in Hong Kong's basic law. Are you capable of opening that meaningful dialogue? From what you've told me so far, you're not, are you? Well, I believe the first criteria of having a sincere and meaningful dialogue would be the Hong Kong government itself trying to be sincere. Well, last time when they were inviting student unions to the dialogue, they're trying to have it privately. They're not willing to make it public and to invite other stakeholders. And, they, and even when they're trying to invite... it could have been a start. I come back to that point. It could have been a start. How it? could it be a start when they're not being sincere? We do not believe there would be any kinds of meaningful consensus made in the dialogue. When they're trying to arrest our fellow protesters, when they're trying to put us in jail, how can we believe that there would be a meaningful or sincere dialogue? At least they have to stop the prosecutions first. I mean, not forever, but they at least have to show some sincerity. Some sincerity. People are worried that you're becoming increasingly rigid and inflexible. Joseph Cheng, who led a coalition of pro-democracy groups in 2014, says, no one ever dares to say, think about it or accept it. Anyone who does so will be severely attacked. We come to a consensus, we stick to that position, and we cannot shift. Is that the way you're going to be able to start negotiations? This rigid inflexibility? You're in danger of becoming just as inflexible as Beijing, aren't you? I believe the discussion about the future of Hong Kong or how the movement would go is, is like mushrooming, especially in the recent days when we see that there has been an escalation of violence while we're not achieving anything. We're not forcing the government to respond. I believe there have been more and more discussions. and. Well, and I believe that like peaceful means would be the only way out for us to resolve the current situation in Hong Kong. Peaceful believe, means, but, but a group of your protesters have been beating up people um, who, who just think differently. September the 15th, we had a, a group who beat up a 49-year-old Hong Kong man, beat him unconscious, because he dared to challenge what the group was doing. Chao Hu Tung remonstrated with your fellow activists. He shouted at them, love China, I'm Chinese. But they beat him up, unconscious, had to go to hospital. He was in critical condition when he arrived, but he survived. Is that the way you deal with people who think differently from you? Well, of course, that, that would not be the very ideal way. I do. You, could, you don't even condemn it. We do not condemn any kinds of... You have any no principles, of... then. If you're not going to we do have principles. inhuman treatment like this, you can't even look me in the face and say I condemn this kind of inhuman treatment. We will not do any kinds of public condemns. But still, we are trying to switch the tactics to a more peaceful way. What about the violence against businesses that are seen as unsupported? How, how do you imagine you're protecting democracy by trashing ATM machines and Starbucks cafes? How does that help you preserve democracy? Well, I believe protesters are vandalizing underground stations, vandalizing those Chinese-owned companies for a reason, because they would like to bring actual harm to those companies so that... So Just that because they don't support you? It is not about they don't support us. It is, it is about they are They're the ones who are... They to think for themselves. They have to have their windows smashed and they have to have their ATM machines trashed because they just don't think the same way as you do. And you want to preserve democracy. Well, I believe that would definitely not be the best way. However, they are doing that for a reason. And they are not, I mean, they are trying to be rational. And that's why we're not trying to condemn them publicly. But still, we do have reflections. We do have discussions about those vandalizations. And there have been more and more voices about that we should actually try to explore some peaceful ways. So. You're taking part in the local council elections, um, not you personally, but mm. apparently 450 candidates from the mm. pro-democracy pro group. Mm. Are you willing to switch your attention from demonstrations and violence to politics, to the slow, painstaking, often tedious business of politics in order to make Hong Kong work better for its inhabitants? Are you willing to do politics instead of just demonstrations? 
Well, I believe the two things have to go parallel because one side about politics, when we've got pro-democracy activists trying to get into the institutions, we are trying to change the government structure by by a democratic way, by elections. And at the same time, we have to continue our protests so that we can put pressure on the Hong Kong government itself. And I believe the two things are not contradic contradictory, and that's why we have to make it go parallel. And I don't believe that we have to put all of our attention, all of our focus on district council elections and try to stop any kinds of protesting. But so still, I believe that protests have to be in a peaceful way. So it's you. It's been good to have you on Conflict Zone. Thank you very much. Thank you.